Dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning and a very well welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Eva Jakusheva de Francesco and I am a policy analyst at the Sustainable Prosperity for Europe program at the European Policy Center. And we are honored to host this virtual event on just energy transition. Today's policy dialogue presents the final outcome of the Just Energy Transition project that over the past year has been exploring the lessons of past industrial energy transitions. Today, the European Policy Center will also publish a paper summarizing main results and the recommendations of the project. Don't hesitate to have a look at our web, uh, website. The paper is not there yet, but should be there any moment. As the paper concludes, a just energy transition will not happen by accident, and a decisive action from policymakers will be necessary. Numerous challenges lie ahead on the path to climate neutrality, and, at, and as Franz Timmermans once, Timmermans once put it, this is going to be bloody hard to do, but it can be done. Today, we will focus on how it should be done in the order to achieve an outcome that is just for workers and their communities. We will do so together with an esteemed set of panelists from the ranks of policymakers, industry representatives, and policy analysts. Let me welcome Mr. Jens Geier, member of the European Parliament's Committee on Industry, Research and Energy. Hello, Jens. Uh, Ms. Adela Tesarova, head of unit, consumers and local initiatives, just transition at the DG for Energy at the European Commission. Welcome, Adela. Uh, Ms. Corina Zirot, uh, senior uh, policy advisor at Industry All. Uh, and our own uh, EPC, and, uh, former EPC analyst and now external expert for climate and energy, uh, Mr. Thies van den Busch. And also a very well welcome to Stefan Talhoff, policy officer at the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Today we are expecting around 100 participants and we very much look forward to the discussion with you. Uh, just a few words on practicalities. If you are interested to ask a question, please use the chat function or raise your hand. But please do keep your question short. And don't, if during the initial remarks, you already want to pose a question, don't, uh, don't hesitate uh, to put it in the chat as soon as possible. Now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Talhoff. Uh, the floor is yours, Stefan. Yes, thank you very much, and um, a very warm welcome also on behalf of uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung to this policy dialogue uh, today. Um, I'm Stefan Thalhofer, I'm the Policy Officer for Economic and Social Affairs at the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung's EU office, and I've been with, uh, with this project over uh, in, the, in the running of this year. Um, so it's my pleasure to just really briefly say a couple of words as an introduction and to say why this project is important uh, for us uh, and for us as Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, yes, let me start by saying the evident, the ongoing uh, climate transition is uh, a major effort and linked to many, many challenges. And uh, the European Commission is, of course, not alone in repeating that nobody should be left behind in this uh, transition. Um, yes, it is indeed of primordial importance that we get this transition right and that it be socially just. Uh, this is quite evidently crucial, of course, to the well-being and the prosperity of the people. However, and equally important, and I'm underlining this uh, also from the perspective of FES, since we are a promoter of democracy worldwide, um, it should not be forgotten that a mismanaged uh, transition is also quite an existential threat, actually, to our democracies. And mismanaged meaning a transition that is insufficiently inclusive, lacking stakeholder participation, one that would be too slow with poor outcomes and increasing inequalities. Uh, such a lack of both input and output legitimacy would spur people's mistrust in political decisions and so undermine our democracy's credibility and efficiency. The uh, often cited yellow vests in France or more generally populist parties capitalizing on anti-climate change sentiments show yeah, how even yeah, relatively small variations in prices or announced courses of action, if they are felt unjust, how this can mobilize the people, erode their trust in democratic processes, 
and eventually in reasonable climate policies altogether. The result would be a lose-lose situation, I would say, for all, because one, the effects of inevitable climate change would worsen living conditions for all, and two, it would most probably bring about harsher and less democratic political decisions in order to cope with the urgency of increasing climate-induced conflicts. And this, of course, is absolutely, absolutely to be avoided. Now, Europe, with its long heritage of carbon emissions, and as a key actor in the multilateral context, has a strong responsibility for shaping, driving, and steering climate policy. Therefore, the EU must take a lead in an ambitious ecological and at the same time socially just transformation. And in doing so, show and credibly convince that a swift transition is possible. Now, today and here, uh, we will discuss the results of our joint project with the EPC, proposing some elements for making a socially just transition work. We do so by showing that energy transitions are not new. They have happened before in different variations, of course. Um, and with this perspective, it allows us to take some lessons from the past, which we finally apply to the current EU policy framework. This has been, I think, a very fruitful exercise with very valuable results that we will discover just in a few moments now. Let me, to close, uh, thank very much uh, Thijs van den Busche and his team with the, F uh, with the EPC for running this project, for doing the research and writing the paper, and also presenting it in just a minute. This has really been a smooth cooperation. Uh, I have learned a lot myself, and I really do appreciate this. Thank you. And also in the name of FES, I would, of course, like to thank our speakers on the panel. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm really looking forward to hear your reactions. Uh, it's going to be the first reality check for our recommendations, and I hope they do work and they will find some agreement. And last but not least, of course, I would like to thank also uh, the audience for being with us today. You're quite uh, here in big numbers, which is good. Uh, so thank you for your interest, for later comments, and uh, hope so, hopefully also for spreading uh, some of the messages that will come up during the discussion. Thank you again. Enjoy the debate. And uh, yeah, back to Eva. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, now, I would like to open the panel discussion. And uh, as first, uh, I would like to invite Thais, who is, as you mentioned, uh, standing behind the paper that will be published today. So without further ado, Thais, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, Nat, I would just like to ask um, for the sharing. I, I see that I have it. Thank you. Just share a couple of slides. Um, so. Thank you very much uh, for these introductions and, and thanks also, uh, Stefan, for your, your, your introduction and, and for the support in this, in this project. Um, as Eva also said, um, we will publish today uh, this discussion paper on just energy transition for workers, where we look at uh, lessons from the past uh, to learn for achieving a, a just transition today, basically. And to start off uh, our, our lessons and Stefan also already refers, uh, referred to this, but I would like to start with a couple of uh, observations about the current energy transition uh, compared to the past, showing that uh, we actually need uh, this transition to be just. The first observation is that the current transition is more broad and more far-reaching than past transi transitions have been. In fact, we're not dealing with one energy transition, but we're dealing with multiple simultaneous uh, transitions. The transition doesn't only affect uh, the uh, sector of energy production, but it also affects uh, the way we use uh, energy, for example, the shift uh, from internal combustion engine cars towards uh, electric vehicles. Um, that also affects, obviously, employment in a broader uh, sense. So several se sectors are uh, affected, and it also affects several uh, sectors' employment uh, prospects and increases the challenge for uh, the labor market. The second uh, observation about the current transition that differs it from past transitions is that it can arguably be more planned than past transitions because it is policy driven. Uh, past transitions were often driven by economic circumstances, certain fuel source becoming cheaper than another. Whereas the current transition is one in light of uh, climate change, mainly uh, phasing out fossil fuels and um, um, increasing energy efficiency and uh, the use of uh, 
of renewables to achieve our, our climate targets. They can be more planned, but the other side of that coin is that this policy-driven nature also means that uh, the transition depends on public support to be sustained. And I think uh, uh, Stefan already referred to this a little bit, but basically, if we do not have public support, if the transition is not just and acceptable for people, then we will not have a, a transition because those policies will need to be uh, sustained to achieve uh, the transition. And for this, in uh, my paper, I use or try to use a holistic approach that pays attention to two aspects of justice. One aspect is distributional justice, making sure that the output of policies is just for workers, and procedural justice, making sure that there is input by workers when uh, designing energy transition policies. And with this uh, attempt at a, at a holistic approach, we come to six broad categories of, of recommendations for uh, the EU that you can see here. And I will uh, give you a bird's eye view of, uh, of the, the proposals uh, that are in uh, this paper that, again, will come out uh, later today. The first kind of broad challenge is the reorientation of industry in order to uh, guarantee uh, the most optimal effects for uh, employment. What we learn here from the past is that transitions may be delayed by support for incumbent industries that can be uh, from governments, for example. Um, but delaying um, uh, the change, the transition itself, may risk, in fact, more severe consequences for workers. Uh, you risk when supporting an incumbent industry and employing employment in that industry. Um, by that support, you risk, in fact, creating a kind of bubble where uh, there is a large employment that is maintained until a crisis happened. Eventually, the sector faces uh, decline, and then the transition does not happen in a timely and planned way, exacerbating the, positive, uh, the possible negative effects on employment. So the lesson here is a just transition needs to happen in a timely, so as soon as possible, and planned uh, way. We make uh, re uh, recommendations here to shift support away immediately from fossil fuels towards uh, electricity, mainly uh, renewables, of course. Um, first of all, by ruling out fossil fuel subsidies once and for all under the multi-annual financial framework, but also, on the other hand, to incentivize further electrification, which is a central pathway for uh, decarbonization. For example, via the review of the state aid guidelines, the CEEAG, or uh, the extension of certain measure of me measures of the energy price toolbox. Uh, for more details, you can have a look at, at the paper uh, um, on, uh, on these uh, recommendations. And we also identify the review of the uh, energy taxation directive as a major opportunity uh, to reform taxes on uh, fuels in the member states. Um, it will be a challenging policy to implement because of uh, the member states and their views on the ETD, but at the same time, an important one to shift away taxes from electricity towards taxes on fossil fuels, also allowing for a more just uh, transition and giving people uh, in time the right uh, incentives to change their consumption. The second big part is uh, creating an enabling environment for the industrial transition, maximizing uh, employment in uh, the new sectors. Here we recommend to make sure that the EU gives the member states adequate fiscal space to invest in the, green, in the energy transition, to make green public investments um, through the review of its fiscal rules, uh, specifically uh, sustainable, uh, uh, the Stability and uh, Growth Pact uh, will be reinstated uh, at some point in the future, and we encourage the EU to review these uh, fiscal rules so that, for example, it implements a green public investment targets to uh, incentivize um, the transition. And also one important aspect is the Just Transition platform, uh, which already exists. And uh, here, Ms. Tessarova can maybe or hopefully tell us uh, a bit more. But for now, the work seems to focus a lot on coal regions. Um, we see the need for encouraging further industrial symbiosis, for example, in the car manufacturing sector, where there is uh, also a big challenge for the supply chain, smaller companies in the car, manufa uh, in the car manufacturing uh, sector. And, for example, the Just Transition platform can be a way to, to further encourage industrial symbiosis for the transition. The second uh, big aspect is uh, the employment aspects for uh, workers reorientation, how to reorient workers, not just uh, industries. 
lessons from the past here indicates that we need to take into account regional specificities. Uh, so there is a strong need to, uh, to monitor and map regional changes and to work together uh, with regions, with member states to uh, achieve a reorientation of workers and uh, a strong need for reskilling and upskilling, which is also recognized by the EU to give workers new employment opportunities. Here we identify in our recommendations uh, a strong need for better definition and mapping, defining how jobs and skills are changing because of the transition. We suggest specifically, and again, I refer to the paper, but uh, a change in the ESCO classification. ESCO, which already is a classification for employment uh, and skills amongst others, but um, can go further in or can help define uh, how jobs and skills are, are changing for uh, the green transition. And that also allows for a better mapping and understanding of uh, regional changes, because it's not because uh, jobs grow in one place that they all also grow uh, or increase in another. So mapping those regional changes and uh, skills and job needs in function of the green transition. Then uh, the second big aspect is to improve incentives for reskilling and upskilling and validate skills better. First, we highlight uh, the ETS review that is uh, upcoming. Um, which can further uh, support also worker skills and reskilling and upskilling, not only the transformation of industry, but also validate worker skills as an essential part of uh, an industry transition. Second aspect is in relation to the just transition mechanism, which includes also support for reskilling and upskilling. And here we highlight again the need for broad stakeholder involvement, specifically social partners, uh, uh, trade unions, um, uh, to uh, throughout the implementation of reskilling and upskilling uh, efforts, and to introduce a right to retrain and a better validation of non formal and informal skills. And then I come to the last part of the, the puzzle uh, that I present uh, going beyond the workplace. Obviously, it is not enough to uh, achieve a transition for uh, workers only at the workplace, but also we need to look at uh, aspects beyond the workplace. We need to, first of all, reinvigorate the EU social contracts. Uh, member states right now accept the EU's legitimacy to deal with uh, climate policies by having acknowledged or by having ratified the European climate law. But they face dissent, and this is also a reality within their member states, within their electorates, due to social costs related to the transition. So first of all, the EU should make sure that it supports member states' social policies, again referring to uh, stability and growth pacts and uh, the uh, possibility for further investment in green social policies, also paying attention to social policies, not only um, uh, employment and industry. Uh, the second aspect is that, and this is a broader comment on the just energy transition, is that those policies should not only focus on employment, but also go beyond employment itself. Um, um, so uh, taking into account further social aspects, equality aspects in, uh, in several climate policies. And then we also uh, discuss the social climate fund, where we argue that uh, social aspects should be put central uh, in addition to uh, the existing energy efficiency uh, investments, specifically by compensating first the poorest for uh, those changes. And then the final point relates to procedural justice in a broader way, not only distributional with the EU social contract, but also procedural justice, where we need a broader attention to stakeholder involvement. Specifically, we highlight uh, the need for that in the territorial just transition plans and potentially the upcoming social climate plans. And we propose to create an EU framework to encourage and streamline the use of just transition commissions. Uh, those just transition commissions have appeared, for example, in Scotland, in Germany, in Canada, um, and have been able to increase stakeholder and citizen engagement. And we propose to encourage and uh, streamline the creation of just transition committees through um, uh, commissions through an EU framework. And so looping around to uh, what I started with in the beginning, our recommendations, uh, these are kind of the six broad uh, categories. And concluding on that, uh, we are uh, facing another man on the moon moment as uh, President, Commission President von der Leyen said it so well, not only for the energy transition, but also for a just transition. We have a short time, but planning is possible to make the transition just and acceptable for workers and citizens. But to do that, the just transition needs to be put central in uh, energy transition policies. And at the moment, at times, even though the Commission obviously uh, pays uh, strong attention to it, and it is one of the three objectives of the Green Deal, 
um, more can be done to put just aspects uh, central in the energy transition. We need to pay attention to distributional and procedural justice for employment. We need a holistic appro approach as presented in these recommendations on the right for workers, but also beyond the workplace. And as Stefan uh, introduced in the beginning, if not, we risk challenges by the public, a risk of blocked and delayed uh, policies and populist parties capturing this. And so this is a real and essential challenge for the energy tra transition, the EU and its uh, member states. And with that, I will conclude my uh, presentation and uh, give the floor back to Eva. Thank you, Thais. You really managed to fit a lot in uh, such short time. Uh, and it's uh, very interesting to hear about the unique character of the transition and the importance of the public uh, support for its very success. And I am really uh, curious to hear the, the opinions during the Q&A on the recommendations that, that you've made. Uh, before I hand over to Corina, uh, we had a message uh, from uh, the audience that the sound is not very, very clear. Uh, I checked with our IT technicians. It should be fine on our side, but if you are experiencing problems, especially more of you, please do let us know. But I assume everything is correct. Now, uh, I would like to give a word to, to Corina Atsirold, who is a senior policy advisor and uh, industry all for Europe, uh, which is a federation of European trade unions. Corina, the, please, uh, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Eva, and um, thank you indeed for inviting me to this um, final event, um, also concluding with your report, um, which I find is very important and give, uh, gives very important elements. And I think I can only, um, we can only um, underline um, uh, very a lot of elements that have been just put forward uh, by Thais in his, uh, in his uh, presentation. Um, as you already introduced myself, um, uh, we are Industry or Europe, we are um, a federation of trade unions um, in uh, industry, manufacturing, in energy and mining sectors. Um, we represent 7 million workers um, uh, across Europe, um, also outside the European Union, um, um, in Turkey, in, in the Western Balkans, in Iceland, Norway, Switzerland. And um, yeah, so um, it's clear that we are quite concerned uh, at the moment um, by climate policies. Um, our members are quite concerned by the acceleration of speed, but um, we, um, I, I would like to um, again um, underline that we need um, a much higher climate ambition. This is what we all um, uh, know and we all um, agree on. This is urgently needed because um, uh, we also are, are already witnessing um, the impacts of climate change today. And this is also impacting the world of work, of course. So we need to uh, tackle this and we need higher ambition. Um, but um, as, as industry all and representing the 7 million workers in the industries, uh, probably in the front line of the transition, um, uh, that comes with higher climate ambition, we, uh, we need to really uh, look into uh, the way how to um, shape this transition. We need to avoid, um, as Thais said, uh, and as a report lays out, an unplanned uh, transition. We need to avoid the, um, uh, the uh, bad experiences we, we have seen and we have learned from the past to avoid also the political consequences of that. Um, and uh, um, I think also Stefan alluded to it. Um, we can only agree um, we need to plan it better and we need to involve uh, workers and, and citizens to avoid also a, a backlash, a political backlash. So what we uh, demand as industry all is that um, uh, we have uh, the European Union uh, puts forward an ambitious, comprehensive just transition framework that uh, reconciles climate ambition with social ambition. And it has to systematically involve all stakeholders and of course, obviously, uh, workers uh, are important in the debate. So in, indeed, climate ambition must be social ambition at the same time, and there should be no contradiction between the two. Um, it should, there should be no trade-offs between the two discussions. 
Um, we also think that uh, the EU climate ambition what, and, uh, um, and uh, the 2030 target and the Fit for 55 package uh, that was released this summer, they are of course a deliberate policy intervention um, into the market. So actually uh, this also requires a strong policy intervention on the social side to shape the, the transition in a socially responsible manner. So this is a, a fundamental uh, demand from our side so, uh, to really um, you know, put at an equal level, um, as I said, the climate ambition with social ambition. Um, we, we talk about uh, 25 million uh, jobs in the uh, sectors alone that industry all Europe is, is representing. And they are going to be um, uh, impacted uh, somehow by the transition um, from phasing out uh, fossil fuels, um, but also from the transition in industry to new technologies, business models, um, and uh, yeah, the way changing ways of manufacturing things. Um, and our our uh, members are already. Um, already managing today uh, or have to manage with company restructuring with introduction of of, of uh, new technologies and and um, yeah their jobs are impacted so i i say that because we i just want to make the point workers are at the for, forefront um, of the transition and um, but they are also at the same time important drivers of the transition we are contributing to the transition um, uh, the energy transition through our daily jobs. Um, so the members are really crucial. Um, our members are very crucial in achieving the targets, the climate targets. And this should be taken into account when formulating um, the just transition framework. Um, the Green Deal um, actually offers for the first time a concrete element uh, for just transition with a just uh, transition mechanism and the just transition fund. It's certainly a very important first step, but it's not uh, enough given the dimension and the speed of the transition. So this is um, this is one of the core um, messages uh, that we have as industry all. Um, only um, through uh, supporting the conditions uh, for a just transition, we can uh, really ensure that there is uh, the support of workers and the confidence the, the confidence they they have to have in this project. And uh, for us, uh, it's actually, um, I would like to stress that uh, also as a response to the report. For us, it's really crucial to say uh, this, the social dimension and the social ambition must be more than just uh, re and upskilling of workers. What we need, first of all, is to create uh, jobs and to maintain jobs in order also to maintain the quality of life uh, across Europe, across Europe's regions. So um, uh, when we communicate with our members and we, we talk to our members, uh, what is very important for them is that um, uh, there will be new uh, jobs phased in before phasing out old job, uh, the, the old jobs. And we need uh, to ensure that the new jobs are also quality jobs and that those jobs are created locally. Um, so um, that, that there is a perspective at the local level for the workers that might lose their jobs because as, as uh, the report also rightfully um, uh, points out, there's a strong regional um, dimension. Um, in the transition, there are some regions that are very dependent on on certain industries that will um, disappear or restructure, and uh, there must be um, a future perspectives for that, those regions. Um, our biggest attention at Industry Oil goes uh, at the moment, and I think I have highlighted it also in previous in the previous event, um, is goes uh, at uh, Central East, to Central Eastern European countries that are heavily reliant on fossil fuel and fossil fuel infrastructure. They are, their industries are dependent on, on fossil fuels, um, but they are also heavily reliant on multinational companies and uh, foreign direct investments. And this is really uh, a huge com concern of, um, of our members in these regions. They are concerned about company strategies and how those uh, companies would also ensure the technology transfer that is so much needed um, in their region 
to um, maintain good jobs in the region. They also expect much more in terms of, uh, of closing the gaps between um, Eastern Europe and Western Europe in terms of upwards um, wage convergence and strengthening also the purchasing power of, 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 the, of the people there in the region and increasing the, the quality of life in the region. So this is really important. And I wanted to just highlight because we are doing a lot of work together um, with our members um, there because uh, they are very much concerned by what um, the acceleration of speed and feeling so um, unprepared uh, for what is upcoming for them. As an industry all Europe, and you might be aware of that, and you can see it in my background um, uh, screen, um, uh, we, are, we have launched a campaign on just transition, putting forward five major demands. And I would like to just uh, um, highlight them because uh, this is really important uh, for us when it comes to a just transition. We um, are um, actively uh, calling, as I said, for a more comprehensive just transition framework at the EU level, uh, going beyond the first elements that we have seen with the European Green Deal. Um, first, we need to adapt um, the level of resources that we put in the, uh, um, into the transition. Uh, we, meet, we need much more considering the, the dimension. Um, and uh, we have to also consider that there's more um, sectors impacted than just um, coal and carbon intensive regions. We need an employment mapping. I think your report pointed that out as well. Um, we need a more granular em employment map mapping at the regional level and at local level uh, where, where possible, because we need to really understand um, where jobs fall away, um, where uh, new jobs will be created, um, what uh, is uh, um, the level of employment and what is the level of skills to really understand the problem and to really tackle uh, the problem with a comprehensive and tailor-made plan for at regional and local level to support um, regions and communities. We need anticipation of change with workers' participation. And this is crucial. We are actually as industry all calling for a legal framework for the anticipation of change and giving concrete rights uh, to workers um, in shaping the transition through social dialogue and collective bargaining. So we really need to strengthen this. We need workers' rights, I already said that, not only in terms of um, participation, uh, democracy at the workplace, um, but we also need uh, to uh, to uh, to actually provide concrete rights for workers to um, uh, to you know to be uh, to get access to training for instance to get uh, lifelong learning because um, workers will will co have to cope with transitions throughout their career there will be always um, technology changes because technology is changing and we have been witnessing this throughout throughout. Uh, uh, throughout the history. So um, this is really important. And we, much, we need much more comprehensive policy planning. These are our five demands um, that are really crucial. And uh, when it comes to, to uh, just briefly going back to the Green Deal um, and uh, Fit for 55 uh, and uh, all the other policy tools that have been launched um, to support the transition, what, what we really want to highlight is we need more co coherence between the different policies. We need to really also more, have more coherence between the different initiatives tackling somehow the transition from different perspectives and from different DGs. Um, we need to have a coherence, for instance, between the Green Deal, Fit for 55, and the industrial policy. Um, agenda and the industrial strategy that has been launched. Uh, this is important. As industry all uh, Europe, we are actually involved um, in, in the industrial forum, which is advising on the implementation of the industrial strategy. And uh, it's also advising on the implementation of the transition pathways and the 14 ecosystems. We are um, in the high level group uh, for the energy intensive industries uh, where we are currently discussing the um, ecosystem for the energy intensive uh, industries 
uh, transition uh, pathway, uh, so the transition pathway for the energy intensive industries um, ecosystem, put it like that. And um, we really need uh, to stress that there ne needs to be much more synergies with the work uh, that has been done currently also in terms of the Just Transition platform. I think there could be much more coordination between between the two. It's very, it's it's really it's really crucial to en enhance it. Um, it's also crucial um, looking into um, into the. Um, uh, next to the Just Transition platform, lo uh, looking into the uh, social dimension and what uh, DG Employment is doing, uh, looking into the um, European pillar of social rights and the headline targets um, that uh, have been put forward um, uh, for 2030 in terms of uh, poverty uh, eradication, in terms of uh, putting people in employment, and in terms of uh, putting um, adult uh, the adult population in, in training. So there are three uh, headline targets. It's important that we connect uh, what we've been what we are doing on the energy transition and the climate transition. We connect uh, those uh, climate ambition with uh, strong indicators on the employment and, and social side. And there, these uh, headline targets should be instrumental in guiding our way and assessing um, the, 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 uh, the success of our, our transition. So uh, I think much more coherence between the two is, uh, is needed. And um, the European pillar uh, for social rights uh, as such should uh, be much more strengthened by strengthening its, its implementation uh, and the tools for that. There will be also a council recommendation coming up on the social, um, the social uh, impact of uh, Fit for 55 and the green transition. And uh, our important mes message there is again, it's it's just a recommendation, but we need really stronger elements and stronger rights uh, to to actually push for the social dimension and to make um, to make workers and and society part of the of the transition. Um, maybe last but not least, uh, it's also important uh, to mention that there's good first steps uh, next to the um, Just Transition uh, Fund and the Just Transition mechan Mechanism. I would like to highlight that um, the, uh, the, the draft uh, directive on uh, minimum wages uh, uh, for the first time, uh, or not for the first time, but very importantly, is putting forward also um, very strong um, promotion of collective bargaining which we consider as a basic tool to, um, to ensure uh, quality of jobs in the transition. And um, it as it stands today, as it's proposed by the European Commission and as it has been backed by the European Parliament in its report recently, um, member states uh, will, um, will have to support um, uh, collective bargaining. And especially where uh, collective bargaining is, is uh, uh, coverage is less than um, eighty percent, they will come up uh, will have to come up with an action plan to promote this tool, and this should be happening in consultation with social partners. So this is really a strong element if this gets through um, the council and not watered down, and there is concrete right uh, for for this important element. It's also, the report is also very strong on, um, on anti-union uh, behavior and trade union busting. I think we don't need uh, a trade union busting, we need a trade union strengthening to really ensure workers are sitting at the table, um, that, that uh, we are involved and that we are involved to ensure quality of life and quality of jobs. And I think with having said that, I leave it here. Um, and uh, and we'll be happy to to answer some questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karina. Uh, just to say, uh, Karina will have to leave us uh, at eleven thirty. So if you have questions for them, please do raise them as soon as possible. Now I would like to move to the part where we ask uh, of the on the opinion of the European institutions. We have the honor to have today with us a uh, member of the European Parliament, Mr. Jens Geier. Uh, Jens, the floor is yours. 
Yeah, thank you very much, um, Eva. I'm I'm quite happy with with uh, what I've already heard out of the study of Ms. Van den Busch and also the comment of uh, Corinna Zirold. Um, I have not much to add, but um, perhaps let me share some some ideas um, I had when when. Uh, um, preparing for 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 this for this morning, um, I'm pretty much um, convinced that the strength of the European Union in the transition is a regulatory one and less a budgetary or financial one. I'm not only in the industry committee; I'm also in the budget committee, and so I know pretty much about the instruments that we have and about the amount of money that we have and i'm afraid to say that um the money that can be um spent by the european union on the issue is only the cherry of the on the cake but it is not the cake um the the, the most of the money that has to be spent to organize a just uh, transition uh would have to come from the from the national uh, budgets and uh, even if uh, even when when uh, uh, Franz Timmermans is inventing new instruments like the Social Climate Fund, I would like to uh, recall that um, um, that the EU has not no not one instrument or only one instrument to distribute money directly to the people, and that is uh, with the means of the agra uh, of the uh, of the um, um, uh, of um, uh, agrar politics, where where the funding for for the farmers goes uh, via the national chambers, that would be Landwirtschaftskammer in Germany, um, and um, so I am afraid that a lot of the money would um, only go to the national budgets, like the social uh, climate fund, and then it is on the uh, on on the um, on the wisdom of the national. Um, governments how whether this money spends the people which are meant to profit from this fund or not i mean i can um i can uh, i'm optimistic that progressive governments will do so um but probably they are only um vanishing in the national budgets and um are um mixed up with uh, the national um, um, instruments that are already at hand so um when we think about um uh, gaining gaining the money organizing a just transition i go with uh, along with what uh, what uh, Thais has uh, explained when it when it comes to taxes but i would like to remind us all that the first draft the first um, uh, energy uh, taxing directive was torpedoed in the council just because the council had the position that taxes is not um, in the um, is not an issue that the EU should uh, should deal with so this is also probably a dead end when it comes to political practice I underline I support the demand but I'm not optimistic um, that that uh, um, we will uh, succeed in in going so so um, some ideas I think um, to ensure jobs to to um, secure jobs on the side of clean industry we need something uh, that we in call, German call Grüne Leitmärkte so leading markets for green product that can be done by public procurement or just think of quota for uh, uh, steel produced without fossil fuels in production of cars something like that that we can regulate um, we can we have to do something on the OPEC side of, of enterprises in order to um, not let them go down in the transition also on the state aid side and uh, I couldn't I couldn't agree more with all that was mentioned about risk killing and they'll let me add something when i mm, that is can be probably said by me but not by industry all dear corinna um when i when i talk to comrades from center or colleagues from center and east european or southeast european countries i sometimes hear that the trade unions are simply not 
ready to move into the transition. So there might be, and and I heard the example of one country where the, where we where they have a, 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 a mining um, trade union that is simply not ready to discuss on the transition, but is stubbornly def, uh, defending the mining jobs. So this is something where also the trade unions and and the international organization of the trade unions have to do some homework in order to make trade unions ready. So for, for my country, I, I, I can oversee that and, and for uh, uh, the trade unions and in, in, in more in the Western uh, countries, I, I oversee that most of them is are, are ready to go into a fair transition, of course, but some of them might not. So um, um, we are also having a political problem here because the populist right in some of our countries simply deny the necessity of actions or um, um, altogether the situation that we are facing a man-made climate change that might go together with uh, with the uh, position of some trade unions and might then become even more uh, uh, dangerous not only for the progressive camp but also for uh, for organizing a transition in these countries and because of that um, I I go very much along with the idea that that has been uh, named uh, uh, transition councils or committees I think this is very much necessary to do and i think this is um um the the, the hour of employee participation or what we call in germany mitbestimmung so um re going really into the subject of an enterprise and starting a discussion with the management about what can we do where are the alternative markets what skills do we have where do we need a reskilling? Where can be a, our future uh, uh, market for our products? Um, and what we have to do in order to achieve them. And I've seen a study on CDFOP that from CDFOP that um, claimed um, that the job losses might not be that much because after the transition, we go back to new ones. And I have some doubts about that. You know, I'm I'm um, I'm in, in in the German metal um, metal working uh, union, the IG Metall. I'm in the in a supervisory board of a, of a steel factory myself. The steel factory um, uh, uh, relies 50% of their product in in a combustion uh, in a combustion engine. And while we are now starting to look for new markets, we know. Mm, that all the enterprises who are now the customers of that steel mill, who use this steel for parts of the combustion uh, uh, um, engines, have to totally rebuild um, uh, their, their their management plan on their products. It is very simple. You have much more parts that you need in a combustion uh, engine than you have in an electricity engine. And so while we hope to manage the transition inside the huge German star, uh, um, car, car brands, we are quite um, 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 more concerned about the situation in the automotive industry. What is heavily, um, um, what is very much important, very, very important in, in uh, countries like Germany or Slovakia or Czech Republic, um, Austria and, and so on and so on, because they have totally to overhaul uh, their business plan and, and and what they do all together and and um, because we have in Germany, for example, regional um, areas where this automotive industry is stronger than in other, I underline the demand for uh, regional uh, transition councils, and that should be done by the state or um, uh, some 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 regional authorities that can also be done by the labor authority if you have something in your mem when you have some 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 thing, thing like that and the major in in your um, in your member state because at the end it is about um, uh, m means to avoid job losses at the end and reskilling you can do it on the level of an industrial chamber or whatever or even the trade unions can set something up but you need a place where regional authorities who are in the hand of some money um, and regional and or national planning uh, tools 
labor force um, and and uh, the enterprises come together to find a way um, uh, through the uh, transitions. And because I think that that um, um, uh, the council, council of workers in the enterprises are not very experienced in the situation and perhaps also not skilled in that, they need um, uh, uh, professional support. So that can be done by by institutions like Hans Böckler Foundation, um, that is the political foundation of the German trade unions, for example, um, or what has been done in in my federal state of Nordrhein-Westfalen in Germany uh, in the past at about the 80s and 90s, that the state is giving money so that the trade unions or the worker council can hire consultant consultancies that are can support them in setting up a plan from their side how to how to um, steer um, through um, uh, the tr transitional process. I think this is um, um, some idea. National legislation to support reskilling, lifelong learning um, should be brought. Uh, beside all the things that Konau had also said already said on the subject on the agenda of the European Council. I think this is something that has to be done um, very, very soon so that the government starts. Uh, I would be happy about a progressive outcome, but it is absolutely necessary that the member states also start a discussion among themselves about the tools and the necessities of the transition. So that was it from my side. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this valuable insight. Corina, uh, would you like to take the floor to respond or? Yes, maybe uh, one thing uh, that I would like to respond because we are, of course, I mean, we are uh, working with our trade unions, uh, especially also now um, monitoring um, the uh, planning, the territorial just transition planning in um, that they are, supposed to have a role to play um, uh, in line with the um, with the regulation um, and the pr partnership principle um, trade unions should be uh, involved in in the planning to get access to the uh, just transition fund and we see actually um, many more unions um, that indeed were um, were you know seeing just transition even crit critical because it was a transition after all and um, they were defending workplaces and mines. They see also um, uh, um, and they have learned the lessons or they have also uh, gotten the push by, by the COVID crisis. Um, I'm thinking here also um, uh, of our members in Poland um, that are negotiating with their governments. Uh, it's it's a huge, it's, you know, the, the target to um, phase out coal by 2049 might not uh, be uh, ambitious, but it's a huge turnaround in Polish uh, discussions. Um, and uh, I like to highlight that. And there's also at, at the moment um, negotiations uh, taking place to not only um, uh, to not leave that only at the hard coal mining sector, but also um, uh, uh, negotiating on um, phasing out lignite um, and uh, also um, uh, coal fired power. So they, they, our members are involved and we are in touch with them. Um, and uh, we are trying to support them as much as possible, also looking at the social consequences be, which will be huge because uh, um, in Poland there's half of the miners, uh, the coal miners of Europe, um, and we we are we having uh, similar um, processes going on with our Bulgarian members um, that are very concerned uh, in the context of the political uh, situation in Bulgaria, um, uh, lack of uh, political stability. They had three elections this year. Um, uh, they are very uh, much hit, hidden, but also by the energy energy price crisis. There's no um, vision on, 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 on the phase out of coal or of the energy uh, on the energy um, transition in, in, in Bulgaria. 
And they really came to us also complaining about the lack of transparency in the elaboration of territorial just transition plan. So we are uh, working with them and we, we are bringing them together with the commission DGs and we are very uh, thankful to um, also DG Energy that is sitting here in the room, but also DG Video, DG Reform that actually uh, sit together with us um, and, and address the problems, even though of course they don't have any direct leverage to to um, to manage a problem at the local level or at a, in Bulgaria, but um, I just wanted to highlight that um, much uh, has been moving in the last uh, um, uh, last months and last years. And uh, we know it's bloody hard, but we also, as, as uh, Timmermans said, but uh, I think uh, there's also um, the general um, agreement that we need to act um, and that shifting um, the, the burden um, in, to, to future generations is also simply not an, an option and would come at higher social costs. Thank you. Thank you, Karina, and thank you again, Jens. Uh, now, I would like to give the uh, floor to Adela Tesesheva, who is the head of unit, also dealing with just transition uh, in the G energy at the European Commission. Adela, please. Thank you very much, Eva. And um, many thanks uh, for, for this very interesting uh, report. Um, so if I may, uh, a few, few remarks uh, from my side. Um, I mean, as, as, as other speakers said, I mean, this is a very interesting piece of work. So yeah, uh, very supportive of it from my side. Um, just a few remarks. Um, I fully agree that, um, you know, without a fair transition, we will not have a transition. And this applies not only in the EU, this applies globally. And when we see that the interest in just transition is increasing globally, uh, we have seen it very much in the context of the climate COP, uh, the, the last one, COP26, and um, it is really a topic on which we are more and more engaging with our global partners, and uh, it is something that um, can actually speed up the transition globally, you know, if we engage more on just transition. Um, so I think that's something not to be forgotten. We should not only look inside the EU, but the more we talk about just transition with the others, the more we speed up the global transition. Um, second, um, just transition is already at the heart of the Green Deal. Um, it is true, we are starting from the carbon intensive regions and sectors, um, and it's true that we need to go further. And this is already starting to happen when we have broadened uh, the interest also into individuals explicitly through the Social Climate Fund. Um, the recommendation which is being prepared will look at the, the whole thing, you know, um, more holistically, let's say, uh, to kind of put the different streams together. Of course, we also have just transition elements in our legislation. We have the effort sharing regulation, which has always been about um, fairness uh, among member states. We have a lot of distribution aspects embedded in the emission trading system as it exists now. So, you know, it's not a new topic but it has been scattered a bit everywhere. And I think it is a fair thing to, to ask to bring a just transition together, all these elements together. Um, and, um, and it's true that uh, there are sectors which uh, will be a big, uh, big issue. And uh, the, the car manufacturing ecosystem with all the suppliers, it's of course uh, the biggest challenge ahead of us probably. And, um, but of course we have to start somewhere. So currently we are in the first step, we are focusing on those sectors and jobs, um, you know, which will disappear. That's why it's always talk about coal regions. And when I say coal regions, it's not only about mining, it's also about the use of coal in the power sector. And these are jobs that will simply disappear. This, we are not talking about transition, we are talking about jobs that will be gone. And so we have to focus on these first, but already, uh, the commission or let's say the just transition work is already looking at the heavy industries uh, where important transitions will go through so these jobs you know these industries should not disappear we, we should transform them in line with the green deal but you see the the kind of the progression now starting from those jobs that simply will not be here anymore and then the the heavy transformations or important transformations with which the industrial sectors have to go through and of course the car manufacturing ecosystem will be an important one 
but we shouldn't forget that the transition is also happening in the energy sector. Beyond coal, the electricity sector will change considerably. The gas sector will have to change considerably. So in, when we talk about the energy transition, um, let's say just transition within the energy sector, it's not only coal. But again, we are staffing, but it's more most urgent because these are the jobs which we won't keep. We will, of course, keep electricity sector jobs, but they will change. Um, so um, that would be on this. And then I have maybe three remarks on uh, like suggestions or kind of thoughts about the study, if I may. Um, my first one would be that um, it is clear that without fairness, without just transition, we will not have the, the, the climate transition. Yeah, the Green Deal cannot be achieved without uh, just transition. But I think we also need to recognize that there are challenges in our economies and societies which are not related to the Green Deal and that are pre-existing. It's globalization, it's challenges on employment and social side, which exist irrespectively of the Green Deal. And actually, which as you, as, uh, as you said, Thais, would in fact uh, become worse if we don't act. Yeah, but I think it's important that we recognize this because it's not everything is linked to the Green Deal and the fair transition under the Green Deal will not resolve everything. Um, then, um, there is the digitalization, which is also uh, creating a lot of uh, challenges for worker skills. And again, by addressing the skills under the Green Deal, we, we don't necessarily address the digitalization challenge. Or maybe we do it at the same time, but it's a separate uh, uh, thing going on in our economies and societies. Um, then my second comment is that um, while we need to make sure that the just transition is fair and just, we also need to recognize that the current system is not fair. You know, the economy based on fossil fuels is not a fair economy. Um, it's, 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 it's very few who benefit from fossil fuels. It is, uh, you know, so very few get the, get the benefits and who pays is the rest of the society and it's in fact also the nature. And uh, the energy poverty, for example, which is something we, we look at in the context of the transition is a pre-existing problem. And it's linked to inability of people to pay for fossil fuels. So that's our starting point. And our, so our starting point is an unjust society uh, where uh, fossil fuels certainly don't help. And my last comment <laughs> um, is on uh, when we speak about workers and then we move to the, to the social aspect. So of course, it's not only about employment, it's also about social inclusion and so on. I think we should not forget that when we talk about workers, we also talk about consumers. And consumers can very well take care of themselves. And I think an important, you know, so of course, um, social policy has a role to play and they are people who need support. Uh, but I think we should also keep in mind that um, the green transition is about emancipating our consumers, making them active on the energy market, moving them away from this passive dependence on energy that comes to my house and that I pay without understanding what I pay. Uh, and I don't understand my bill and I, I, I don't know what to do about it. And I cannot get a better offer because I don't know what to do. I think this, this is changing. And I think we need to see people also more active. You know, they can take care of themselves. They need to be helped. They need to understand how to do it. Uh, so they are not only workers and, and socially, you know, and people who need social support, but they are also people who can actually uh, take care of themselves actively and become active consumers on the energy market. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ada, thank you very much. Um, now uh, we can open the Q&A session. So please uh, do not hesitate to post, a question, post your questions or raise your hands if you have any questions uh, you would like to ask. And uh, as a first question, I would like to pose uh, one to you all. But I also would like uh, to encourage you, if you had some remarks based on the other speakers, please feel, uh, feel free to make all those comments uh, and then we will go to the audience questions. So to my question, we have just heard a number of recommendations and issues that uh, need to be addressed. As Adela just, says, uh, just said, we have to start somewhere. So my question to all of you is, uh, if you were to pick uh, that one issue or initiative that needs to be addressed as first, that has the highest priority, what would it, what would it be? And I would like to start with Thais. Uh, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, 
I mean, one picking one is obviously you you lose a lot of other ones, so <laughs> that is a very big challenge. Um, and one one big aspect I think, and, and that was highlighted also before, is is really about participation and uh, and involving a broad range of stakeholders, and also extending the topics that um, that uh, yeah the stakeholder involvement happens in. Um, I think indeed, um, Adela, as, as you mentioned, it's it's a very valuable start, obviously, with uh, with coal regions in in transition when we're talking about, for example, just transition platform. Um, but in terms of stakeholder uh, involvement, um, I think there is a lot more opportunity to um, to go beyond uh, purely uh, coal regions. Um, that's not only the case in the just transition platform. I think we have to recognize also that jobs will be disappearing, as uh, MEP Geyer has said, uh, will, will be disappearing also in the car uh, manufacturing sector. I would argue at the same time, those jobs, or at least you know, the, the evidence that we have seems to point out that indeed uh, those jobs will be replaced in some shape or form. But I would like to highlight that there is a major challenge there for reskilling and, uh, and, and upskilling, uh, helping those people change jobs and also monitoring. And that's why uh, I propose this, this definition also, uh, or a better definition of changing uh, green skills and jobs to track exactly what is happening, uh, because uh, this is something where I think we are, we are falling short uh, to some extent, a unified uh, tracking of the green transition, which is happening at the European level, but which we are uh, to, a, to a relatively low extent tracking. And that would then kind of cycling back to my, my comment on, on stakeholders and their involvement would also allow for proper uh, stakeholder involvement on the basis of, uh, of, that, uh, of that data. So uh, I would highlight really um, extend further uh, participation further beyond uh, purely coal uh, uh, transitions, because there are also challenges at, uh, uh, in other sectors. And make sure then that indeed the, the participation is encouraged of several stakeholders, which is why indeed we uh, propose these, um, these, these uh, just transition commissions at the, at the national level as one uh, potential option. But uh, yeah, obviously there, there is a lot of work uh, to be done. And, and just to say also, I think that the EU, for example, with an instrument such as the Just Transition Platform has really made uh, strong steps forward to involve um, to involve stakeholders and to have a broader debate on uh, on uh, certain topics, but it can be taken further. So, so that would be my my main point to raise. Thank you. Uh, may I now give uh, the word to to Jens? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like to add to to what uh, uh, Thais von den Busch just said that. The jobs will be replaced. Yes, occasionally there will. Um, and I totally go along with that, but probably not at the same place. So <laughs> that's a problem. So when you have made up a life in, 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 in the Rednania lignite um, area, um, we managed to, um, uh, to um, have a, 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 a social uh, a social transformation in that area that goes along until 2038. And we hope we can accelerate that um, if it is possible to rebuild alternative uh, jobs in the region um, earlier. So that is an, that is an, uh, um, that is a challenge. And I'm coming from the Ruhr area. Um, 100 years ago, my hometown of Essen was the biggest mining um, um, uh, the biggest mining city in the world, and uh, now there is nothing left <laughs> beside uh, monuments. And we have a lot of new jobs, and we have started a trans transformation strategy in the 1960s, and we are still not completely done with it. So um, um, I'm 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 saying, and and I've I've talked to to um, uh, members of the work, workers' council from Volkswagen, and they said yes, they are going to transfer people from uh, the 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 engine construction in Wolfsburg to a battery uh, Volkswagen owned battery factory in Salzgitter, what is not very far away, and even that is a challenge. 
So if your perspective has been that I will be in the lignite mining industry for the rest of, 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 the, uh, of the life, it is not very encouraging for these people if somebody comes along and said, I have a new job for you in the Tesla factory in Brandenburg, what is 500 kilometers away? So um, um, th this is a challenge what, 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 that, that we have to face, um, that, that people might understand that transformation is possible, that, but, but of course they are asking, why do I have to bear, uh, to, 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 to bear the burden alone? And because of that, I think priority should be a regional perspective. Um, I'm, I'm coming, I have a, a background from, from regional uh, economy, um, um, uh, politics, let's say. Um, and what I would now do, for example, for my home, home country of Northern Westphalen is look very closely on the uh, economic structure of Northern Westphalen and find out what is going to change? And there will be a lot of changes in the automotive industry. What is in Südwestfalen, for example? And then I would start to think about what tools do I have? And what I uh, forgot to mention in my first um, in my first remarks was the regional fund. So when when and the, the regional fund is going to be spent until 2027. Um, so it covers most of the decade where um, um, some of the uh, major decisions and the most important decisions of the transition have to be made. And, and then I would think about, um, as a politician, how can I use the EFRA fund, probably added with, with private money or with public money from, 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 from uh, the, 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 the budget of the Bundesland, in order to transform the most vulnerable uh, um, um, areas of of, uh, um, of economy together with the workers. So that would be my priority. Look very close on the ground what is going to change. In theory, we know it, but we have to figure out what is really going on on the ground in, in, in the areas of our political responsibility. Thank you very much. Uh, Ella, um, may I give the floor to you? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think I would uh, probably, uh, I mean, uh, both like my, my speakers mentioned uh, what I would also support. So yeah, I think participation at the local level, uh, that I think is, is, is the first priority really. Um, yeah, engaging people and involving them in these important reflections. Uh, um, maybe just an explanation, the Just Transition platform has actually been broadened from the coal regions because it started as a platform for coal regions in transition. Now we have for quite some time this Just Transition platform, which indeed goes beyond. So I think that the progress is there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs> So Thank you. Know. If I can very briefly, indeed, I, I think that, that has, this broadening has been a, a major step. Um, and just to say that um, I think um, from my perspective, and I'm kind of an outsider's perspective to that, but um, I see less discussion on the other um, aspects. And that is what I wanted to react to, um, something that could be an interesting uh, uh, prospect. Uh, but yeah, I, I do appreciate that. And um, yeah, indeed, um, I think uh, it, it is a, a great initiative and, and this extension has been a very valuable uh, addition to it. Thank you. We have now a few questions from the audience. The first one is more of a comment, but I will turn it into a question from Tobias Kuczka. Uh, he uh, is saying that although this event focuses on workers, it is crucial not to forget about persons who already tend to be marginalized such as long-term uh, or youth unemployed, low-skilled migrants, or people with disabilities. And uh, I would like to turn it into question asking uh, probably uh, the European Commission first, uh, what are the specific measures that the EU is proposing to prepare not only workers, but those marginalized for the upcoming transition? And then maybe turn to Thies later, Thies later what he thinks should be done more. Um, I mean, it's true, um, we are starting from a, a very, um, you know, we are not starting from an ideal world. Um, and of course, the just transition can make things worse. So that's why we need to pay attention to, to its fair. The transition can make things worse. That's why we need to pay attention to the fairness. Concretely, 
what the EU is doing about um, involvement uh, of, of, the, um, of the vulnerable in the society. Um, I think the most tangible is the proposal for the Social Climate Fund, which would explicitly target um, energy poor and vulnerable um, households to help them um, uh, to help them navigate the new um, regulatory framework in which we will have carbon pricing. And uh, the objective of the fund is to um, address uh, these vulnerabilities in advance, so help people renovate their houses and improve their access to green transport so that they are not hit uh, by, by the carbon price when it enters into effect later this decade. Okay. Thank you. Thais, would you like to step in? Yeah, just in reaction maybe to the, to the Social Climate Fund, um, one worry uh, that I would have in relation to this is, is obviously that there is attached to it right now um, this extension of uh, carbon pricing to, to buildings and transport. And so that is, that is a worry in the sense that uh, it might more heavily indeed impact the most vulnerable. Indeed, then you target also uh, to some extent the most vulnerable, but um, the way right now uh, that the guarantees are given that the most vulnerable people will, uh, will actually be in like a similar position afterwards do not seem uh, sufficient uh, to me. I think there is a risk that uh, indeed vulnerable households will still be uh, harder hit, um, which is why, um, you know, I think maybe NAP guy has, has something uh, still to, to say about that, but um, why there is a risk indeed of, uh, of these social aspects uh, not being sufficiently met by a social climate fund, which should in the end at the core still have uh, social aspects. Um, and then, yeah, in relation to the, to the question itself, uh, I think also uh, Jens Geier has already highlighted uh, the risk of unemployment, people falling behind in certain regions, which is why I think indeed, and just to agree also on, on his point, uh, I think paying attention to this regional aspect is indeed very important. I think especially the, the historical examples from uh, your region, for example, the Ruhr uh, and Saarland regions uh, also um, have shown that uh, transformation is a laborious, is a hard uh, process. At the same time also that uh, uh, the transition for workers is also uh, possible between sectors, uh, even though that is a longer process uh, that requires more significant reskilling, et cetera. It requires investment also in, in other sectors that can take that place in those uh, regions. And in relation to that, I just wanted to highlight, and I think that was also brought up before, but obviously, indeed, I, I agree that there are other challenges than uh, the climate challenge, which at times can be even more uh, important or more threatening to employment than the climate challenge itself. And I think that's also recognized by, by stakeholders, by uh, politicians, but just wanted to highlight, for example, in the automotive industry, that uh, automatization of production uh, seems to have almost an as important or a similar effect to, um, uh, to employment or negative effect on employment than a change from internal combustion engine cars to uh, electric vehicles. So indeed, the challenges are broader. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one question uh, about trade unions, uh, which uh, which sounds should trade unions agree with broader alliances at local level instead of, uh, of going alone? Uh, Corinna is unfortunately with, uh, not with us. Uh, would anybody else like to take the word? Okay, I'm afraid uh, this question <laughs> came too late. Uh, and uh, the next question is from Alison Hunter asking in uh, what ways are multi level governance challenges being addressed to ensure that? place-based and inclusive local responses help to drive the just transition. Thais, do you have any views on this? I must say the sound fell away for a second. Can you please repeat it? Uh, in what ways are, uh, so we have a question from the audience, uh, from Alison, and she's asking, in what ways are multi-level governance challenges being addressed to ensure that place-based and inclusive local responses help to drive the just transition and in this way avoid the tendency for this to driven by member states, often discouraging complexities and specificities at local level. 
Yeah, um, so I think that relates to some extent to what we discussed before on uh, on the regional uh, the regional aspects, uh, close involvement of uh, of regional uh, governments, um, local plans. I think I fully agree there also with uh, with Jens Geier uh, that we need uh, a proper planning for uh, the transition, specifically also at the local regional levels. Um, the question there, of course, is, is how the EU can, can further uh, encourage that. And that's kind of where this idea of just transition commissions, amongst others, um, uh, at the national level, but then also implying that the regional and local levels are uh, involved in that, uh, can, uh, can play a role um, in order to encourage uh, these plans to be made together with, uh, with those stakeholders. Uh, we've seen, for example, in the example of Canada, um, that there was a very broad uh, consultation also leading to, uh, to uh, yeah, very specific regional local plans. And same, I would say, for the example of the Scottish uh, Just Transition Commission, there too we see um, that they, they do manage to put together uh, a plan that can, that can help uh, for um, the procedural aspects, procedural justice of the, of the Just Transition, including regions and, and local governments. Thank you very much. Uh, my uh, next question would be on, on procedural justice. Uh, and I would like to ask, how can be the voices of local stakeholders in the transition be better incorporated into policymaking processes? What is EU already doing and what it could do more to support uh, such efforts? And we have also in the audience uh, one of the um, uh, one of their audience members uh, pointing out that several regions in Europe now start to stimulate and experiment uh, with and support much more strongly community initiatives, uh, uh, also in the energy sector, often based on social economy model. And uh, these are often linked with uh, green transition or employment creation, social inclusion, and so on. So in your views, what could be more done to support the, the local stakeholders to have a fair voice in the just transition? Can maybe say I've just muted myself. Yeah, I've just muted myself. I would like to ask Adela if she has uh, any views on this. Thank you. Well, I can I can say what we are doing. Um, so um, when it comes to the coal regions in transition, and again here we we were a bit of pioneer. Um, so um, a lot has been put in place to activate the um, the actors on the ground in the regions. Um, in the concrete localities. And uh, this has been done um, through um, technical assistance, which has been provided uh, from, from the commission and which allowed to kind of bring together the local actors to start a discussion about the future of, of these jobs and what could be done. Um, and, and then we have created a coal regions in transition platform. And so the whole, um, I think since the very beginning, and I'm talking 2017 when we started this, uh, the um, the effort has really been to to activate the local people, to talk to the local people, um, and to to, to to in fact even even not talking to governments, uh, but the approach has been directly to the concerned regions and localities, um, and so that's what we kind of started and we kind of pushed it as a bottom up initiative. And of course, now the territorial just transition plans, they are drafted by the governments or sometimes by regions or by both. So of course, um, the national procedures enter into place and the commission cannot change that. But we have certainly been doing for, for now four years what we can to lock, activate the local level. So that would be one example I would mention. And the second is energy communities as indeed mentioned in the, in the, in the chat. Um, we have legislation to encourage the setup of energy communities, either the so-called citizens energy communities or renewable energy communities. The point is to, to allow um, local actors um, to, 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 to become active on the energy market, to generate, to supply electricity uh, or energy, uh, or to take care of building renovation um, as a as a non-profit uh, business, you know, as it is an it is an initiative which has energy objectives, uh, just transition objectives, but also uh, environmental, social objectives. So it brings uh, these energy communities is a, is a kind of type of startup 
you know, which uh, uh, legislation in BNF Energy allows and encourages. So it's a startup of, of local people who come together and uh, they decide to take care of their energy supply or uh, energy production even, or of renovating their houses. And this can grow in investment opportunities, of course. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's a very good thing. Um, the legislation is rather recent, so these are still quite new, but we have examples uh, in all member states, hopefully now. And uh, yeah, it's a great thing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adela. Uh, as the time uh, is uh, passing very fast, we have five minutes less towards the end of the session. I would like now to take the last question from the audience. And after that, uh, give each of you uh, 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds uh, to one minute for, for closing remarks. So the question we were asked is, uh, can you identify some good examples of just transition plans? And I believe this is a question for Thais. Sure. I mean, what we see, I think, uh, and that, that is also highlighted in the paper, is um, the, the creation of specific plans uh, to just transition commissions. That is one thing that is that is related to the to the paper. Um, I know that it does not relate directly to the just transition plans of the member states. I think that's maybe uh, more something for uh, the commission to to comment to what they uh, what they what their per, uh, prospect, uh, perspectives on this are. Um, but yeah. Related to just transition plans, um, I think one challenge there is uh, the, the need for stakeholder involvement uh, to make sure that they are uh, well balanced. I think um, the just transition commissions have shown in Scotland, in Canada, that they can uh, result in very practical just transition plans that uh, lead to concrete, uh, concrete results with uh, public support. So in very brief, that would be my, my response. Thank you. And uh, let's start with the closing remarks. Uh, Mr. Geyer, can I give you the floor? Or yeah, yeah, ma'am. Um, yeah, thanks. For, thanks for the for for the discussion. I think it has uh, shown that we have a lot lot of work ahead. Um, um, I mean, the trans transformation is not be done like like this. It is a a, a bloody a uh, whole blood, blood, bloody amount of work and on all um, on all levels. So it's not only the European or the national level, it's a regional and local level where it has to be done. And I can uh, underline what, what Thais uh, van den Busch has said, that stakeholder involvement is, um, is key. And I would stress that the stakeholders have to be empowered to do the involvement. So they need consulting and they need help and they need um, uh, support um, by, by, uh, uh, by, by the public or by the progressive forces or by uh, scientists who can, who can really um, consult them and, and what would be the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now let me divert to Adela. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I think I have nothing to add. I have spoken a lot anyway. I, I think this is a great work that the EPC and, and partners have been have done. And uh, it's a contribution to, um, to this very important topic, which I think we need to uh, continue pushing. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that. And nothing, nothing more for my side. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Stefan, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, thank you uh, for, for giving the floor to me. Um, there's not much to add except for uh, thanking once more our speakers. And uh, what kind of reassured me in this debate is, is the, that it was stressed that the stakeholders are important and, and also in the line of what Jens said uh, now towards the end that we not only need to claim for more stakeholder involvement, but that we also need to find ways to empower them because there's not much use if we put it in our papers that they should be part of the discussion if structurally they are just not in the position of, of, of taking part. Uh, I think this would be even more demotivating to have stakeholders uh, that are asked to participate and they just cannot do it because uh, the organization is not in the position to, to have the, the resources. So. Um, I'll be happy to learn more, even beyond this project, uh, what, for example, other commissions approaches in the projects that, that Adela has mentioned, 
where they uh, have the, the try to activate the, the people on the ground. I think they, these are promising approaches to, to dig in deeper. So yeah, that's all that I would want to say at this stage. Yeah, and thanks again for, for the debate and, and to the EPC and to our speakers today. Yeah. Thank you very much. And at last, Thais, uh, any concluding remarks on your side? Yeah, I'd mainly like to thank our speakers of today also. Uh, the speakers of uh, before our workshops uh, who have given very valuable uh, input into this, uh, into this paper and also uh, Stefan, of course, and, and Fess for uh, the support throughout. It, it has really been uh, a journey to, uh, to try and help discover uh, the paths forward for, for a just transition thinking back to, to past transitions and um, very hopeful that uh, yeah, some things can be done on uh, the social dialogue, on broadening uh, the work for uh, just transition. And again, I think the EU is really uh, making an effort in this. Um, I think Ms. Tessarova has also in the, in the beginning, I think mentioned these global aspects uh, and that is very much uh, so. And I think as the EU has been a leader uh, before for the climate transition, uh, we can also be a leader on the on the just transition um, and this is the challenge maybe now for the eu in terms of the implementation the effective implementation of uh, the energy transition is to also make it implementable through uh, through a just uh, transition and uh, hope to to have contributed a very small uh, part and would like to thank you again for your uh, for your feedbacks and uh, looking forward to, in fact to, to continue that debate Thank you very much and thank you very much for all for the stimulating debate and also to our audience for joining us and for the excellent questions uh, which further stimulated uh, this debate. Uh, I would like now to close the session and hope to see you in the future discussing uh, just transition and other topics. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>